Who here has ever been anxious? Who here has ever worried? Who here has ever been scared? Who here has ever been, I don't know, disheveled, frantic, not when you're on a roller coaster? Okay, so you're in the right workshop here. And do you notice, did you happen to look around? You weren't the only one that put your hand up. No, one of the devil's biggest tricks is to convince us that we're alone, that no one else is experiencing what we're experiencing. And that alone often robs us of the peace and joy that God desires to have for us. So much in the world, especially over this last year and a half, was the opposite of peace. Who here spent any time reading the news at the beginning of the pandemic? Who here read any social media tweets, posts, things about the pandemic and how everyone was going to die and we were never going to get off this and it was the end of the world and God hated us because of this thing, right? What did those things do? Did they actually bring you peace? No. But what did you do the next day? Did you go back and read even more? I'm seeing a couple of heads that shook. No, hey, <laughs> good for you. And because it's important for us to begin to recognize what are the things that rob us of peace that God intends for us to have and then work at avoiding those things. So hopefully we're going to get through a few of those here. We live in a world that is very much filled with anxiety, with trying to control things, um, that's very much almost chaotic. And chaos is not from the Lord. I know in my own life, okay, do you remember when you were in seventh grade? It wasn't too long ago for some of you. Some of you, it was a little bit longer. Okay. When I was in seventh grade, I went to a small Catholic school. There is eight people in eighth grade. Eight? No, maybe there's eight eighth grade men. Okay. I got into 12 fights that year with those eight eighth grade men, and one of them was my cousin. <laughs> Doom! Um, I definitely, growing up, was not someone that had a lot of peace. I was considered incredibly hot-headed. And my mother tells me stories of when I was three and they were asking me to come into my grandmother's house and I like had some sort of breakdown and was banging my head off the driveway of pavement. Don't do that. Maybe that's what happened to me. I don't know. But, uh, but I know that growing up, and there's a lot of things like family. Anyone ever have any anxiety over family? Yeah. I come from a divorced family. My parents divorced when I was probably about seven or so. And probably sh should have, or things went very sour, just say, when I was about three years old. Maybe that's why the anxiety, what not happened. I don't know. I'll ask Jesus when I get to heaven if it really matters then. But God doesn't desire that chaos for our lives. But so often everything the world tells us very much perpetuates that chaos, anxiety, that fear, that worry, everything that robs us of the peace of Christ. But we know that Jesus came and died on the cross to restore us to God, to restore our hearts, our lives, and that we would be back <laughs> to really flourish in the way that God intended us and has always intended us to flourish. Sometimes, though, we lose our peace when things, different things happen, right? Maybe we're in a dating relationship and it breaks up and we've lost their peace. Or f good friends of ours begin to move away. Or maybe there's a family relative or a good friend that passes away. Or maybe even a pet. I don't know. All these different things can rob us of our peace. And we all have these experiences to some form or f another. Even financial burdens at times. We get worrying. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? I don't have, right? So how do we regain peace? The starting point is going to Jesus. There is no other starting point. If we try to do it on our own, we're going to fail. To be able to go to Jesus. And you realize that you don't have to try and earn Jesus' love. He already loves you just as you are. He sees both the good, the bad, the perfect, the gifts that you have. He sees your shortcomings, and he still chooses to love you as you are. Our dignity comes 
from being a child of God. When you were baptized, you were welcomed into the family of God, removed of original sin, your, your dignity restored to how God always intended it to be from our very first parents of Adam and Eve. The Lord has a plan for you. Jeremiah 29 and 11, For I know well the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for woe, plans to give you a future full of hope. Sometimes ways that we can overcome those things that rob us of our peace is to begin to memorize scripture verses and speak that truth over our lives. When we recognize, oh, wait a minute, I'm getting all scared about the future. I don't know what school I'm going to go to or if I'm going to make it onto the sports team or whatever it is. And we like begin to speak scripture over our lives. It's a powerful tool. St. Paul says scripture is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. We can use that sword, holy scriptures, to help fight us in the battle against things that rob us of peace and allow Jesus to restore that peace into our lives. Sometimes we think we need to be perfect to be able to go before our Lord. I won't ask you to raise your hand, so please don't. But if you've ever felt shame, and I'm convinced that shame is actually a, a tool of the evil one to keep us away from God. Because shame says that I'm bad. And guilt says I did something wrong. But shame actually attacks our identity. But the truth and the reality is that you don't have to be perfect to be able to come to the, the Lord Jesus. The world tells us we have to be perfect. Uh, but Jesus accepts you as you are. Uh, and as you saw earlier when I was inviting you to raise your hands, you're not alone. You're not the only one. Um, and it's important to realize that. Because when we think that we're alone, when we isolate ourselves, um, then we end up kind of compounding <laughs> that lack of peace. Right now, there's not just one thing, but now I've, I'm also alone, and no one loves me, and everyone hates me, and I can't do anything good. And you can hear all these different things that are actually not truth and reality. At times, and if we're open to it, we can actually encounter peace in the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulties. So I shared yesterday briefly that, you know, my first time to a Steubenville conference was 30 years ago. Two weeks after that experience, a little bit like Mari, I ended up having an inner ear infection. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an inner ear infection, but you lose your equilibrium, your balance. Literally, the rooms were spinning as if you'd done like the dizzy bat thing, right, where you're going around and around and around and around. Okay. The older you get, the harder it is to do that, I assure you. So I ended up spending a week in the hospital. And literally all I could do is sit in the bed with my eyes closed and it felt like I was in a bowl and just kind of swishing from side to side to side. And I could have approached it like, oh, this is the worst thing ever. I'm not able to work. I'm not able to see friends. I can't talk to anyone because we didn't have phones in the hospital room. Whatever. My family's not here. I'm by myself. But what ended up happening instead is I took some of the songs that I learned at the conference, and that became my prayer. And I found myself practically wrapped in the arms of Jesus. Now, you have to remember, I was 13, 14 years old, didn't understand what was happening, didn't understand the severity. No one could really tell me how long this was going to happen for. I literally felt like I had to learn how to walk a week later. You know, using a wall because I still didn't have balance. Um, and yet in the midst of something that seemed bad, the Lord brought forth his great good that I could spend an entire week with him in prayer in a hospital bed. Not something I would have thought of even three weeks earlier. If we're open to it in the midst of struggles and trials, we will be able to encounter God. We will be able to encounter the presence of Jesus. There's ways that we can anchor ourselves to Christ. We can anchor our souls to Christ 
How do we do that? By addressing the internal spiritual struggles. I was looking through some of the questions, and one of them that came up a couple of times, and we'll get into more of them in a bit. But when I was, well, how can I be at peace if I'm not willing to forgive or I won't forgive myself? Now, that's a great question. That internal spiritual struggle, right? Oh, I hate I did that again. <clears throat> Maybe it's just me. I don't think so. So what can we do with that? Uh, the most powerful antidote against unforgiveness this might come as a shock to you, but it's actually forgiveness. Right? Um, and so how do we forgive? It's like, you know, I remember having a fight with my brother because I have a younger brother by 14 months, and we, like, scrapped all the time growing up. You know, f seven years old, it's like we get in a fight, and mom says, forgive your brother now. Oh, I forgive you. Or, I'm sorry. You know, and there's, like, no intention whatsoever to that. Uh, holding on to bitterness and anger and unforgiveness uh, robs us of our, of our peace. But we can let go of that by a little prayer of forgiveness. You ready for it? Very simply, in the name of Jesus, I forgive, name the person, for, name the thing. And those of you who are here at the prayer talk, you know, we were talking the difference between spoken or verbal prayer and mental prayer. And I would argue that in a prayer like this, it needs to be spoken. God spoke and the world came into being. He didn't just think of it. He didn't just uh, imagine it. But he spoke it. There's a difference of reality spiritually when we speak our prayers, especially true for forgiveness. And to be able to speak that. In the name of Jesus, I forgive. Maybe it's my father for, I don't know, like him coming home drunk last night. Whatever it might be. Sometimes the person we need to forgive is ourself. In the name of Jesus, I forgive myself for turning around and hating myself again when I said whatever it was. Powerful prayer. But it's not magic. Sometimes we may have to pray it a hundred times because you know what? That sibling or family member or teammate or whoever it was has done a hundred different things to us. And you can recognize if you still need to forgive by if there's that internal thermometer and you kind of recognize it going up when you see that person or you think of that person. Or maybe you hear yourself, oh, there's that. And you like start to gossip again. Those are all indications. Oh, maybe there's something there to forgive. So we invite Jesus in his powerful name to help us to forgive. Sacrament of confession can also be another powerful way, especially when we recognize that we've committed a mortal sin and that our spirit is completely disturbed. You know, and for something to be a mortal sin, you know, there's three pieces to it, right? It has to be of grave matter. We have to know that it was wrong, so full knowledge of it, and then we have to freely choose to do it. So when we have those th three things and we commit that sin, you know, then we need to get back to the sacrament of reconciliation. And I'm glad that so many of you have already taken advantage of that this weekend. If you haven't yet, go. <laughs> Don't cheat yourself of that. Okay? Be a powerful way of being able to anchor our souls in the peace of Christ. Um, anchoring ourselves... I don't know what your own bedroom looks like, but I notice that mine over time kind of starts collecting things. You know, like the dresser starts filling up. There's a little pocket change here, and okay, here's a little card that someone gave me, and some more things here. Oh, here's some sunglasses, eye cleaner, you know, and the dresser starts filling up, and then the desk starts filling up, and there's papers here, or maybe bills, or whatever, and things begin to get cluttered. And after a while, I recognize that the floor starts filling up. You ever have that happen? Yeah, I thought there'd be some heads nodding. And have you recognized now, for those of you who have had that experience, you walk into your room and say, ah, I need to get this cleaned up, but I don't have time now. And you put it off. 
And each time you walk into your room, it's like, ah. Oh. And it just, it starts actually robbing you of your peace because of the cluttered and messiness. Okay? I had a friend that actually demonstrated this to me. It's like, yeah, I'd come home from work after like a full day of work, and I'd come up to go to park the car in the garage, and the garage was a disaster. Like, you know, bikes were all over the place, things hanging, dropped off, garbage over here. It stunk. He said, and I realized I had to get the garage cleaned up because it was robbing me of the peace. And so often that happens in our own lives. And we can't anchor our own se- ourselves or allow ourselves to be anchored by kind of working at removing <laughs> some of that chaos around us, that cleaning things up that we can clean up, being ordered. Now, you don't need to be a neat freak where, okay, if there's like a little speck of dust, it's like, <gasps> No, don't go into the phobias, okay? That's, that's not going to be helpful. Okay? And then another area that we can also work on is, you know, what does our social sphere look like? The type of people that we're around. Uh, think for a brief moment, something called like a, a continuum. So think over at this side, you have people that are really positive and happy and joyful and love you, and people over here who are always grumpy and complaining and nothing's ever good. Where do your friends fall on this line? If you're around the people that are like this all the time, I hate that person. They're never good. Or are they over here, someone that's joyful, peaceful? Because who you hang around is going to influence how you experience life. I think it's safe to say that those who are here today hopefully are aiming to be more like this person here. And that happens when we become close with Christ in our relationship. If your relationships are with everyone over here, I would encourage you to start finding some different friends or lead them to Jesus so they can move over to that other group. The human heart finds peace in simplicity, surrender, and trust which all lead us to be authentically who God has intended us to be. So a couple of ways that we can foster the peace that God offers to us. One of them is being still. Who here has ever found themselves busy from like the time you get up in the morning to the end of the day? Yeah, I thought so. What if, and sometimes you have to do this, You know, we live by schedules. We'll die by schedules. What if the first thing you put on your schedule is, here's my prayer time to be quiet and still with the Lord. 15 minutes minimum or half hour. Or what if throughout the day you blocked out five-minute times? It's like, okay, I know I've got this downtime here. I'm going to spend five minutes, and I'm going to reflect on one scripture verse. Choose a verse the night before so you don't have to waste four minutes finding it from experience. And just to be still and kind of ponder that ancient tradition, Alexio Divina, with that scripture verse. Uh, To be still with the Lord. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes, for many of us, what we need to do is use the word no a whole lot more. Not to your parents when they ask you to do something. I live with one of the friars I live with who's uh, about much older than I am. He reminded me very early on, it's like, no is a complete sentence. And it's true. We don't have to do everything. Everything is not dependent upon us. No, we don't have to pretend to be the savior of the world. And just to be able to say, no, I don't need to be going to all of these social gatherings, or I know I don't need to be involved in a sports every single day of the week. It's okay. Let go. We open ourselves to the peace of God. Uh, sometimes uh, finding our voice and spending time with others, communicating with friends and family, being able to have good, healthy, balanced conversations. Have you, can you think of a conversation you've had with someone that was really life-giving recently? Yeah. And how good that is. 
to be able to foster those times, to be in communal relationship, appropriate relationship, not all this distorted, perverted type of relationship, but one that's actually like looking heart to heart. Ah, beautiful gift. Letting go of control. Isn't that something that many of us want to do? We want to be in control, right? We want to be in control of our lives. We want to be in control of our families' lives. We want to be in control of our friends' lives. We want to, you know, plan out our entire life from now until the time we're 105 and everything we're going to do and our bucket list is letting go of that control, surrendering. One of my favorite scripture verses Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. So often I find myself that when I, I recognize I'm beginning to try and control, like, Jesus, help me to trust in you. Who here is familiar with litanies? Got an idea what a litany is? Okay, our divine praises last night was a little bit like a litany, not quite. Okay. Um, but I would encourage you, there's something called a litany of trust. Beautiful, powerful prayer. Um, you can find it, it's on the Sisters of Life website. Um, and maybe it's something that you go and you pray through this litany, and a litany is really like all these different kind of sentences, not necessarily commands, petitions, with a, a similar response after each of them. And you can pray through it, but you don't have to try and do everything in that litany at once. Maybe you pray through it and you look for one thing in that litany that you're going to try and practice and grow in that virtue. Or maybe you turn around and you write your own litany of trust. Well, what's that look like? You go to your journal, dear diary, he was so beautiful. No, just kidding. I'm glad someone's listening. No, you go, go to your journal and you start writing down what are the things that you're trying to control. And then after each one of them, put your own response, whether it's like, Jesus, I, help me to surrender this, or Jesus, I surrender this to you, or Jesus, help me to trust you. And we put a response like that after each and everything. And then each morning when you wake up, use that as part of your morning prayer. Spend a few moments and just read through whatever that litany is that you've written. And you invite the Lord Jesus into each and every one of those situations so that we can let go of control and we can allow him to truly be Lord of all of it. And finally, sometimes when we're looking for peace, and there's absolutely no shame with this, we actually have to seek the help of the healthcare professionals, whether it's seeking a counselor to be able to talk through and process through and acquire tools to deal with some of the hurts that life has sent our way. Sometimes it might even mean as much as getting onto some medication. Not because you're bad or there's something wrong with you, but because that medication can help kind of bring you to more of a, an even keel where you're able to really work and process through stuff. And there's no shame in that. The Lord gives us the health sciences to help us to thrive. So seeking professional help sometimes um, needs to be part of it. We can't just spiritualize, and it's dangerous to try and spiritualize everything. Uh, but we do want to come before the Lord for all things. Lastly, having a scripture verse that you hold on to regularly, almost like a motto, so to speak. So mine's from uh, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. My brothers and sisters, the Lord offers to each of us constantly an outpouring of his peace. He desires to restore you to that peace as his sons and daughters. Perhaps the most difficult thing for us is to be able to receive it. And so I'd encourage you, if you find yourself disturbed, anxious, fearful, whatever it is, simply ask Jesus, come with your peace. I desire to receive it from you. 
A simple prayer like that can do profound workings in our hearts and in our lives. With that, I'm going to invite up a couple of the team members, and we're going to uh, try and answer a couple of the questions. I was looking at them, and uh, they were definitely uh, pretty substantial. Great questions. If you didn't get a chance to submit them yet, you can go to the My Parish app, and I will see if I can pull them up at that point in time. But to help us answer are my great friends, Mari and Jimmy. You can welcome them. All right. So instead of listening to me, let's see. You can decide who wants to take this question first. With all the chaos in the world, how do I remain peaceful in my mind and heart without being distracted? That sounds so much like a question we got during the prayer workshop. Was anybody here? that last workshop as well, a few of you. It reminds me of this beautiful little passage of St. Augustine in the Confessions. He talks about peace as tranquility of order. What he means by that is our life has to have a proper order to it, you know? It's a little bit like Father was describing, you know, the dresser or the garage. If it's a mess, sometimes our whole lives feel like a mess. That's certainly true when our soul is a mess. So when Jesus really is on the throne of our heart, when he really is the, the one that we are seeking after first, if, if he's the top of the hierarchy of our lives, everything else really does sync up. And so when I find myself anxious, when I find myself slipping into almost a, a paralysis at times because there's so much going on or I feel so overwhelmed and I'm busy or I'm just distracted by life, not able to be radically present in the moment, it's probably because I didn't pray that day or at least pray deeply and make sure that Jesus was in fact on the throne of my soul. And that's something I think happens really deeply and really personally in prayer and it's a daily thing. It's a daily surrendering. It's not something that you just do once a week on a Sunday at Mass. It really has to be this constant, Jesus, you are Lord of Lords, you are King of Kings and I trust uh, that you are the one guiding me, directing me, and very much moving my life forward each day. Thank you. Mari, maybe you can uh, start with this one, and then we'll see if, what we can add to it if need be. How can I be restored to peace when I'm stuck dealing with addiction? How can I find that peace when I w was clean, happy, and sober, but not this person who has become addicted to st something so negative? Yeah, so addiction has been something that um, I've seen personally. And so it, I, think, I think a big part of it is like, what's at the root of your addiction? Like, what are you actually longing for? And so whether it be drugs, whether it be pornography, whether it be whatever, like, what do you actually want? Because those things isn't what you want. Um, that's masking something that's at the root. And so taking it to the Lord and saying like, Lord, like, you know, I'm struggling with this. Help me to figure out what's at the root and help me to combat that. Um, and this is where, and I've said it before, and I'll say it 10, 20 times until my you know, face is blue, like this is where Jesus and counseling is gonna be really good because the Lord can help you from a spiritual perspective, um, but then a counselor can say, well, this addiction, like where did it come from? And where in your memory? And how can the Lord speak to those memories? And be careful who your counselor is. Please get a Catholic counselor, a Christian counselor, they understand, but getting to that place and then seeking help you know, in college, I had like a group of women who we all struggle with different sins or different um, addictions to some way, and we kind of all met up. We called it, you know, AA, Angels Anonymous. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was like all of us were really upfront, like, I'm trying to break this addiction. And we had people there with um, suicidal thoughts. We had people there that were cutting. We had people there that were eating disorders. We had people there with pornography and masturbation. We had people that started with alcohol alcoholism. Like, and it was an opportunity for us to say, like, this is what I'm struggling with. I don't want to do this alone. God gives us these, these people that place in our lives to do this. And so um, take it to Jesus, get to the root of what's going on, seek help and take action. And lastly, be patient with yourself because if it's a real addiction, um, it's gonna take time and you might fall. So get back up and keep walking. Thank you. Amen. That wasn't supposed to happen. Awesome. Um, next question and uh, yeah. Maybe both of you can share. What are your best practices to block, outside, block out the outside noises and find peace? 
I mean, sometimes it is just go straight to prayer. I say almost always that's a solid option is go straight to prayer. Even something simple like the rosary. I was interviewing this guy that some of you guys might know, Matt Marr, for a podcast. It was probably like two years ago. And Matt very quickly opened up about the power of the rosary in his own life. I wasn't really asking that question. I wasn't really going there in the conversation. We were just like talking about his new Christmas record. I mean, it was, and then suddenly he's talking about the rosary. And I don't think that's been a huge part of his prayer life up until that point. But lately the rosary has brought him a peace that he cannot even put into words. So really the answer sometimes is go straight to prayer, even if it's just a simple memorized prayer like the rosary. But I would say also, especially when you're dealing with anxiety or maybe addiction again, the great way to kind of splash water on yourself and get you back in the zone, back into reality and out of your fantasy or out of the temptation, is to call somebody you really love and you trust, someone that is a part of a group like the Angels Anonymous that Mari just mentioned, right? Someone that knows your soul even for five minutes and can just talk and pray with you. That for me has been tremendous, having even a few people in my back pocket at all times that I can call in crisis, in temptation, or in any kind of debilitating sort of anxiety that I might be feeling, and they suddenly talk me out of it because they know me, and they know where I struggle, and they also know what's real, and often in those moments, we're living in a fantasy world, not reality. Yeah, I would agree. I would think um, being rooted in prayer and so repeating prayer, or scripture specifically, is super helpful um, too. And I repeat myself like sometimes I'll look at the news and I'll just be like, this world sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's this like joy of I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. And kind of like claiming that like, Lord, I belong to you. Like there's a lot going on here, but I'm made for something more. Like I'm made for heaven and in heaven there's no tears and there's no anxiety and there's no depression. Like and I'm, I'm, I'm longing and clinging to that. Um, and a big thing, I'm really big on music. Um, so for me, like, I got my playlist. One of them is at the core, because it gets me to the core, you know? Um, and it's really like music that is gonna help me to speak truth and shine light when my mind feels so bombarded. And if it's at a place of like anger, because sometimes I'm so distraught and I'm so angry that I can't, like I need to go for a run first before I pray so that I can get those endorphins out and kind of like really focus and be able to still my mind because if I'm too much, like I, I, I need to do something to be in a place to really receive what the Lord is trying to say. Yeah, I think running can be a great way of burning off some energy. Punching a wall, probably not such a good way. <laughs> Punching bags are fine. <laughs> Punching bags, maybe okay. And journaling, journal. I'm on my 20th life journal. Yeah. Pick it up. Nice. Um, one little practical thing that... I've done and encourage people. It can work both well, in a lot of different ways, um, especially towards temptations. Because let's be clear, temptation is not sin. Okay? There has to be that action to kind of receive it and do the temptation. But one of the best tools I know is simply take, put your thumb on your index finger and trace the sign of the cross. And as you do it, to say to yourself, name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, recall your baptismal identity can be a very powerful way. So I don't know if you can see that in the back. And kind of like here, and you start coming down the cross. Very simple. No one sees what you're doing, so you can be like, have your hand in your pocket, you know. Uh, I think it's too many, like, really beautiful women around here. Okay. It's in the name of Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. You know, whatever it is. Um, but again, a way to kind of recenter back to the Lord Jesus. Okay, sorry. Uh, going through all the pain and heartache of a loss of friendship and betrayal, how can you find peace and trust? I'm going through that right now. That is so hard. When you have felt betrayed by somebody you really love and that you thought really loves you, and probably still does, but it's just having a rough stretch, you know? Here's the reality. Everybody is a little more emotionally ill than any of us realize at any given moment, right? Even the people who have it all figured out, they seem to have it all together. I promise you, they still struggle with some level of insecurity, some level of self-doubt. And so sometimes people say and do crazy things that maybe it takes them months or years to actually regret and then repent of. 
And so when you're in that awkward place of feeling betrayed and hurt and really broken in a particular relationship or friendship, all you can really do is control your forgiveness of that person, even if they never offer an explanation or an apology. But you have the power to forgive them. As Father said, Jesus, in your name, I forgive so-and-so for this incredible pain they've caused me, this profound sense of betrayal. Now, if it's a close friend, you ought to lovingly call them out and hope to God for the best. And maybe focus in on your own feelings so that they're not like totally shut down by your, you know, sort of barraging them. But if you can say, hey, man, like I, I haven't felt this disrespected or unloved by somebody I care about in years. And I'm just really having a hard time processing it. Like, could you help me understand what's going on? Find a really gentle way to confront people when you're in the midst of those situations. And then again, hope and pray and maybe even fast for their own healing because they've got their own issues. Hurt people hurt people, right? We've all heard that. And to be really gentle and really patient, but to forgive them so that the unforgiveness doesn't turn to bitterness and then eat away at your own soul. Okay, um, this was a question that was posed somewhere and I don't can't find it directly right now, but there's something along the line, how can I be at peace when I feel like the church rejects me because of, because of my own feelings or the ways that I live my life? And I'm going to guess that that was directed more towards someone that I don't know if it was they're in a, a sexual relationship or a dating relationship that was imprudent or there is like um, same-sex attraction or what it might be, but let's say any of those things. Yeah, um, I think as teachers, this is something that we are exposed to a lot. Um, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with students that are struggling with same-sex attraction or transgenderism or whatever, and um, they come to me, and it's it's such a, uh, a difficult thing and a beautiful thing because um, I want them to know just how loved they are you know, and, and how welcome they are. And so you have to have this conversation of like, the Lord loves you and you're so good and, and you are welcome here. And I think the problem that we're having in this world is that we're associating our sexual orientation with like our identity of like who we are, but at the root of who we are is son or daughter of God. And, and I'm not defined by like, who I like. I don't go around saying like, hi, I'm, I'm Mari and I'm straight. Like, it's just like a part of me, but at the core, I'm first and foremost, like his daughter and his son. Um, I want to be completely transparent and say, like, if this is you, I understand why that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to recognize like publicly that it is very hard, especially because members of the church haven't always been as loving or welcoming as we should to the person, right? Um, and I think sometimes we associate the sin and the person too much together. Um, but the person, like you are always welcome in this church. Like always, you are always, always, always Amen. welcome in this church. Um, yeah, thank you. Go ahead and clap, um, absolutely. And because, and then like the more we can understand like what God asked of us and why. And this is why I invite you to dive into theology of the body, like really dive in and understand because the more we understand the purpose of marriage, of sex, of all these different things, of what it means to be male, what it means to be female, then these truths can help heal us aspects of our heart and, and hopefully bring us to a place of freedom. Um, and, and we're all called to a life of chastity and, and that's like how we're gonna encounter freedom to the full potential. So um, you're loved. You are welcome. I'm praying for your healing and restoration um, and know that, that God is here and he will never, ever abandon you. Anything to add? Thank you very much, Mary. My only follow-up thought is the passage from St. Paul about the thorn in his side. That some of us, in fact, are given lifelong struggles. Mm -hmm. And it's meant to keep us humble and utterly dependent on God as our Father. Mm. 
And so it might be that the Lord is going to bring about some profound restoration in your soul this weekend and deliver you once and for all from a particular temptation. It happened for St. Benedict. It happened for St. Francis. It happened for St. Thomas Aquinas. These guys had a moment where in a heroic act, they overcame a temptation, and the Lord promised them that they would never struggle with it again. I mean, that would be pretty cool. But the reality is, for most of us, Temptation is the only way that we can grow in virtue. It's the only way that we can grow in dependency and trust. And therefore, it's something that God allows. He doesn't will the devil to tempt us or to give us lifelong struggles, but he allows it knowing it that it can bring us more intimately into relationship with him and dependency on him and utter abandonment to him, the only one who can save us, who can fulfill us, and who can really ultimately restore us as well. So don't be afraid of the thorns in your side. I've got plenty myself. Thank you, Jimmy. And I want to echo what Mari said, um, that if this, is a per- if this is you that struggles with something of this sort, um, that you are always welcomed in the church. And I think one of the things that's happened, um, sadly, both from uh, some of my brother priests and other people that work in the church, is that we've turned around and we've taken a sin or a person's sin, uh, whether it's private or public, and we've turned around and made it like an end-all, be-all. Um, and the reality is, is that mortal sin is mortal sin. None of it is good. All of us struggle with mortal sin in some area of our life. If you don't and you're a saint, please come and introduce yourself to me. I want to learn how you did it. Okay. Um, but the reality is, is that we're not defined by our sin, and we all have struggles. We're all called to virtue in the midst of those struggles. And I think sometimes that's where the confusion comes, is that the church invites a person into virtue and says, you know, you have this struggle, but you don't have to respond to that struggle by living it out. I had a friar that I lived with jokingly said, well, the easiest way to get rid of temptation is to give in. That might be the easiest, if not the most prudent way. Growing in virtue, um, and the virtues are very attainable. (laughs) They're gifts given to us. Again, sometimes asking for them um, and not becoming... Our society is so hypersexualized and focused as if that's the only thing that defines a person. And that's an absolute lie. There's so much more to you than a sexual orientation or a type of relationship that you're in. So the church invites you to holiness. And sometimes that holiness means that we have to deny ourselves. And it can be a struggle. Priests deny ourselves. It's natural to want to be married, to have a family. That's good. Priests take a vow of celibacy. Is it a struggle at times? Absolutely. But it's not impossible. There's a real gift with it. Okay, I'm going to get off that bandwagon for now. I'm happy to talk with others if you have questions about that. Um, Last question here is, this might be a doozy, so we'll see. How can I be at peace when my mother, who is a serious Catholic, makes me constantly feel as as if I'm not enough? No matter what I do, she knows I struggle with depression. She has slowly made me lose faith because of her actions, and I don't know how to deal with it. This just hit hit a nerve. (laughs) Whoever said this, I understand. Um, I think especially when you grow up in the Catholic faith, how many of you guys are your parents are like really into your faith? Parents? Okay, awesome. That's awesome. I I was the preacher's kid. My parents are preachers, and it was beautiful, and I hated it all at the same time, right? It was this thing that, like, I understood the beauty, but there was this pressure to be a certain way, to act a certain way. I remember being in the car, and, like, we would be fighting, and then we'd get to the church, and I would be like, okay, we're here now. Like, we're, we're done. And I'd be like... A little halo comes up. <sighs> like, it was this thing of, like, I felt like I couldn't fully be myself, and it was very, very frustrating. Um, and in the part of like struggling with suppression and not being heard, that's also very difficult because as a parent of Catholic faith, sometimes they're like, just pray it away. Just like, you're just not praying enough and that's why you're struggling with suppression, which is so annoying, right? Because there's so much more. 
And so if this is you, like number one thing I'm gonna invite you to do, which is gonna be really you know, important, tell your mom how you feel. Like tell her like, hey, I don't like it when you say this. And when you don't accept, like when you just say my depression is something that's whatever, I feel hurt because there's actually something wrong here. And Jesus is great, but like I need help. And if a parent can't hear that, then they're not do they're living up to their full vocation as like mothering in the proper way and sense. And whatever it is, like we need to take ownership of our faith. And the more we take ownership of our faith, we understand that like God loves us and wants to incorporate us and bring us to a place of freedom. And that freedom can come by bringing things to the light. So be bold, talk to your parents, say how you're feeling. And when they say things that hurt you, say, hey, when you say this, like, please don't do that because you have value. And if your own parents can't value you through your words and actions, then as kids, we need to be able to vocalize the dignity that God has given us because we were created in his image and likeness. Does that make sense? Thank you. And I think at the heart of every parent is they truly want to see their son or their daughter thrive. They honestly want the best for you. That they have good intentions. They might not always have the tools to be able to help you or recognize that. Or there might be some of their own stuff because realize our parents are not perfect. So we may have to forgive them. Sometimes we might even have to find someone to help advocate for us. Um, maybe that's where you can talk with your youth minister or a guidance counselor at school. Um, and not to put one against the other, but that they advocate f on your behalf with you. Having that companion to journey with you to be able to talk with your parents and share another perspective sometimes can be helpful. And if your parents don't listen, one more thing, write a letter. My mom has received a good amount of letters. Write it all out, leave it in her bed, and just walk away. They'll come find you. <laughs> I assure you. They might not want to talk about it, but they will acknowledge that they received something. Because, yeah, they can hear that, and sometimes them reading it can uh, help resonate more. We are out of time. Can we please give a round of applause to our panel? <laughs>